Joe Simon, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, Bill Finger and Bob Kane, Stan Lee. These names are often revered as the trailblazers who laid the groundwork for comic books to become the cultural force that they are today. When you consider the absolutely massive, unprecedented success of comics-inspired film, those names grow even larger, shine brighter in the pop culture memory of audiences. But one name that is often overlooked is just as deserving of that reverence. If you're a fan of comics and science fiction, the long-reaching influence of Alex Raymond, creator of Flash Gordon, cannot be overstated. You probably have a passing familiarity with the character of Flash Gordon, most likely due to the 1980s schlockfest film of the same name. As goofy as that movie is, and don't get me wrong, it's a classic even if not in the way it was intended, you might be surprised to learn that Flash Gordon's original incarnation is actually a very fascinating work of fiction. There's quite a lot to learn and appreciate about the history and publication of the iconic comic strip. Although Buck Rogers came before Flash Gordon as an early 20th century comic strip sci-fi adventurer, we begin this series on the history of comics with Flash Gordon for various reasons. One important distinction, despite Flash Gordon owing many aspects to his forebear, Flash Gordon creator Alex Raymond not only wrote the original comic strips, he illustrated them as well. These early comic strips are still gorgeous to behold some nine decades later. They've influenced every single comic book you've ever enjoyed in some manner or another. Buck Rogers was certainly successful for its time, and being the first of his kind is an eternal honor that cannot be taken away from his creator, sci-fi writer Philip Francis Nolan. But Flash Gordon quickly became the more popular strip of the two, and in my humble opinion, is far more compelling. Maybe one day I'll cover Buck Rogers and Mr. Nowen, but personally, I've always been more drawn to Flash Gordon. If you enjoy this video, I humbly ask you to give it a like, as that helps it to be seen by more people. I hope you'll subscribe and follow as I explore the history of comics, science fiction, fantasy, and more. Today we'll look at Flash Gordon on the planet Mongo a collected edition featuring the first few years of syndicated comic strips published in newspapers around the globe. By the late 1930s, the strip was published in 130 newspapers and translated into eight foreign languages. Over 50 million people read the strips in these first few years. This was a time before any science fiction or fantasy that we take for granted now. Imagine being alive in those days, the pure joy and excitement that must have emulated from these early strips. The John Carter of Mars series by Edgar Rice Burroughs was popular at the time and definitely established a lot of the tropes and trends that we still see in sci-fi today. But that series only existed in prose format. In 1933, King Feature Syndicate, which still owns the right to Flash Gordon today, attempted to purchase the rights to John Carter for a Sunday comic. But Burroughs couldn't agree to the terms. So, they chose to create their own character, their own world, a brand new adventure. And history was written, as Flash Gordon soon became a household name, beloved by children and adults alike. Flash Gordon is the protagonist of a space opera adventure comic strip, which was created and initially illustrated by Alex Raymond for the first several years. Raymond, who was born October 2nd, 1909, was an American cartoonist born to a civil engineer father who encouraged his son's artistic growth from a very early age. Sadly, Raymond's father died when Alex was only 12, leaving a void where once was a proud father to guide him on his chosen path. Alex Raymond was of course devastated and decided that his future as an artist was not a viable career. He was accepted into a prep school where he began a very different hobby, that of a football player on an athletic scholarship. As distinct from drawing as an activity could be, Yet the experience would influence Raymond's work later, when he envisioned an American athlete who's jettisoned into outer space, 
using his athletic prowess to save damsels and conquer alien tyrants. Many artists have cited Raymond as an inspiration for their work, including comic artists Jack Kirby, Bob Kane, Russ Manning, and Al Williamson. George Lucas cited Raymond as a major influence for Star Wars, as well as Buck Rogers and John Carter. First published on January 7th, 1934, the strip was inspired by and created to compete with the already established Buck Rogers adventure strip. Long before Aquaman was created to compete with Namor, before DC or Marvel even existed to compete with one another. These first comic strips were so popular that they sparked a brand new, highly competitive market, one of comic strips featuring stoic men, and of course it was always men in those days, who were respectively the only men capable of saving these poor, hostile alien planets. Raymond set out to create a similar experience to what Buck Rogers was providing so well, yet distinct enough to stand on its own and perhaps even become the more popular strip. Raymond took inspiration from the 1933 Philip Wiley novel, When Worlds Collide, drawing on the themes of an approaching planet threatening the Earth and an athletic hero, his girlfriend, and a scientist traveling to the new planet by rocket. This was the status quo for the strip in its first long-running story. As famed comic artist Alex Ross says in the foreword of On the Planet Mongo, Alex Raymond's influence extends to nearly every modern incarnation of science fiction and the superhero. Without Flash Gordon, there'd be no Superman or Batman, as Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster base Superman's uniform of tights and a cape on costumes worn by Flash Gordon, and Bob Kane fashioned the first appearance of Batman on the cover of Detective Comics number 27, based on a 1937 Raymond drawing of Flash Gordon. Again, it cannot be overstated how crucial Raymond's work would be to the media so many of us love today. The Flash Gordon comic strip ran as a daily from 1934 to 1992, with the Sunday strip continuing until 2003, which offers a hint at how ubiquitous the character became and remained, even if he never hit the billion dollar mark of his descendants, such as Batman. The sci-fi serial trappings and tropes that permeate George Lucas's Star Wars made it to blockbuster status first, as did 1978's Superman. In popular media, those properties became iconic beyond a level Flash Gordon had, cementing them each as American and global franchises. It could be argued that had a Flash Gordon film been produced prior to and as lovingly as the first Star Wars and Superman films, the media landscape today could look entirely different. These original strips follow the adventures of Flash Gordon, a handsome polo player and Yale University graduate, and his companions Dale Arden and Dr. Hans Zarkov. The story begins with the Earth threatened by a collision with the planet Mongo. Dr. Zarkov invents a rocket ship to fly into space in an attempt to stop the disaster. Oddly, Zarkov kidnaps Flash and Dale. Landing on the planet Mongo and preventing the apocalyptic collision, the characters come into conflict with Ming the Merciless, Mongo's evil ruler. We'll be discussing the problems with Ming and Mongo in just a few moments. It would be irresponsible not to. As you read through this beautiful collection, as the years pass from 1934 to 1937, you're able to see Raymond's art style evolve. It was breathtakingly drawn and painted from the first strip, and yet somehow he still transcends himself year after year, with brushstrokes described by comic artist Jerry Robinson as sleek, brilliantly polished, particularly in the final years of his run. Historian of science fiction art Jane Frank asserted that because of his work on Flash Gordon, Alex Raymond is one of the most famous science fiction artists of all time, despite never contributing an illustration to any science fiction magazine or book. Raymond's vision of spacefaring adventure and stoic heroism went on to influence those mediums and genres more than almost any other artist, save for Jack Kirby, Wally Wood, Mobius, and a few others. Science fiction historian John Clute has said that the comics version of Flash Gordon was graceful, imaginative, and soaring, and he included it on his list of the most important American science fiction comics. As we learned earlier, Batman and Superman were benefactors of Flash Gordon's design. 
but so too was DC Comics' Hawkman costume, which was based on the Hawkmen characters in Raymond's Flash Gordon comic strip. Die! Flash Gordon remains a cultural fixture even now. We're getting no help from Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon? By the way, that's a compliment. And yeah, Peter Quill is an updated, quirkier version of the archetype established by Flash Gordon. The character was featured in three serial films starring Buster Crabbe, all of which were very popular at the time. Beginning on April 22, 1935, the strip was adapted into The Amazing Interplanetary Adventures of Flash Gordon, a 26-episode weekly radio serial. The series followed the strip very closely, amounting to essentially a week-by-week -week adaptation of the Sunday strip for most of the run. As you read through On the Planet Mongo, keen eyes will spot the evolution from more classically illustrated figures into a more proto-comic book style the genesis of what would become Superman, Batman, and Captain America. The DNA of Flash Gordon still thrives today in newer characters like Star-Lord, Mal Reynolds, and pretty much every character from Firefly, Poe Dameron, and even less obvious examples such as Captain Marvel. Alex Raymond's influence is undeniable, but when we look back at history to find the best of humanity, we have to be honest about the worst aspects too. So let's address the racist caricature in the room. Like many during that era, long before the internet and even before the concepts of xenophobia or racism were as studied as they are today, Raymond and many others were susceptible to that repulsive propaganda. In this era in which Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are increasingly targeted due to misinformation and bigotry, it's important to call out these historical examples that most definitely played a role in building a somewhat intolerant populace. As much positive influence as Flash Gordon has had, xenophobia was at a fever pitch in the 1930s, particularly in regard to Asian and Asian American people. And tragically, that attitude still exists. This repulsive reactionary impulse was, and often still is referred to as, yellow peril, or yellow terror, or yellow specter. Yellow Peril is a racist color metaphor that represents the people of East Asia as an existential danger to the Western world. It's a fear derived not from concern with a specific source of danger or from any one people or country, but from a vaguely ominous existential fear of the faceless, nameless hordes of yellow people opposite the Western world. This is an arbitrary, false dichotomy. Sinologist Wing Fei Lung explained the origins of this term and racialist ideology. The phrase yellow peril blends Western anxieties about sex, racist fears of the alien other, and the belief that the West will become outnumbered and enslaved by the East. These racist and cultural stereotypes originated in the late 19th century, when Chinese workers legally immigrated to Australia, Canada, the US, and New Zealand where their willingness to work for lower wages due to desperate need was seen as a threat by xenophobic white workers. In the US in the late 19th century, white nativists spread xenophobic propaganda about Chinese uncleanliness in San Francisco. Chinese workers were deemed unfit for citizenship by the locals, which set the stage for the Asian and Asian American bigotry seen to this day. This abhorrent propaganda carved a path for the passage of the infamous Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882 which remained law until 1942, and was the first law in the US that barred immigration solely based on race. Academic Gina Marchetti identified the psychocultural fear of East Asians as rooted in medieval fears of Genghis Khan and the Mongol invasions of Europe. You may notice a slight difference between Mongol and the planet named Mongo. That's not coincidence. Neither then is the name Ming, his obviously Asian-inspired appearance, nor his merciless grip on the people of his world. These were xenophobic stereotypes being played out in popular culture. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, writers such as Raymond molded the atrocious notion of yellow peril into codified racialist motifs of narration. This was particularly prevalent in stories and novels in the genres of invasion literature, colonial adventure, and as seen here, science fiction. Academic Frank H. Wu said that anti-Chinese sentiment incited by contemporary politicians such as Steve Bannon and corporatists like Peter Thiel are recycling anti-Asian hatred from the 19th century into a new yellow peril. 
This is common to white populist politics that don't distinguish between Asian foreigners and Asian American U.S. citizens. For the first time in centuries, the Western world, led by the U.S., is challenged by a people whom Westerners viewed as culturally backward and racially inferior only a generation earlier. Ming the Merciless, along with Fu Manchu and later Marvel's The Mandarin, are classic examples of yellow peril xenophobia, which was then at its height in the U.S. and large parts of Western Europe. So then the question becomes, how should Alex Raymond be remembered? As a virulent bigot or as a product of his time and of the propaganda that circulated among Westerners? It's not for me to decide for anyone else, and certainly not for Asians, Asian Americans, or Pacific Islanders. I personally choose to spotlight this element as a way to suggest that we take a look at our current attitudes on race, and how we might be influenced in similar ways. After all, if Steve Bannon and Peter Thiel are still openly spreading these archaic ideas, then we still exist in a world poisoned by empty yet extremely harmful propaganda against Asians, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders. Those horrible things! I thought I was lost! Not as long as I live, Dale. An animated Flash Gordon film was being developed at Disney Fox with Taika Waititi writing and directing, but sadly in August 2019, that project was cancelled. Waititi, the visionary director of Thor Ragnarok and Jojo Rabbit, was an apt choice for the adaptation. As he is of Asian descent, and has shown a sensitivity to cultural and racial stereotypes. I have no doubt that Taika Waititi's take would have updated the unfortunate tropes around Ming and Mongo. But for now, the project is not in production at any level. Maybe one day we'll see a big or even small screen adaptation with a decent budget, passionate creators, and an inclusive tone that places Flash Gordon alongside his iconic literary descendants like Batman and Superman. For now, this brilliantly crafted collection will have to do, along with the many low-budget adaptations and the so-bad-it's-good film from 1980. But until someone with a humanist, anti-racist perspective is given reign to rework its unfortunate villain into something inclusive, perhaps it's best left alone. In 2020, the AAPI Fund was established to address and counteract anti-Asian violence and hate crimes. In the description and pinned comment of this video, I've left a link for donations to that fund, and other links for how you can support our Asian American and Pacific Islander brothers and sisters. Published by Titan Books, On the Planet Mongo is the first of seven installments in the Flash Gordon Library, all expertly restored and gorgeously crafted. Let me know if you'd like me to cover Flash Gordon in future videos, or if you prefer Buck Rogers. Feel free to drop your suggestions of what other, newer comics I should cover. Thank you for watching. I look forward to your feedback. Peace.